We'll now move on to the second part of our lecture today, which is discussing the actual input-output or I.O. circuits. Okay, so we discussed up till now the package, how it connects to the board and how it connects to the chip, but how do we interface to the package itself? Okay, we need to create a physical connection to the bonding wire. Okay, so when we talk about bonding wires, what we do is we have this thing called a landing pad. Okay, the landing pad is this thing here. It has to be big enough that with a machine that is in, uh, in real life types of sizes and not nanometers, we'll be able to come and stick a piece of wire here and bond it. So it has to be pretty big. So big, I mean, it has to be about uh, 100 micron or they can go down to maybe 50 micron or so. But um, the, the smaller they are, that means that the process is more expensive and you're going to be paying the bonding house more to actually connect these things. OK, and it, it gets more fragile, it gets more complicated and so forth. OK, what um, we actually do here is if we take our uh, if our chip looking at a cross section of it, we have, you know, all our contacts and metals and contacts and metals and so forth. What we're going to do is we're going to put big stacks of these contacts and metals. So when this actual sewing machine type of pin comes and bonds the wire, it doesn't just push through and break our whole chip. So usually we're going to have at least like about four metal layers uh, on top of each other. Uh, um, on this uh, just to make this thing you it, it will be given to you by um, the package house or the foundry as a GDS that uh, you just instantiate this type of bonding wire which is just uh, a bunch of a big piece of metal with a whole bunch of vias under it a whole array of vias and then another piece of metal in the next metal down and that's also covered with vias and another piece of metal down that's what it is it's just that's the bonding pad Okay, for flip chip uh, packaging, it's a bit different. We don't have this uh, physical um, type of a pin that comes and hits our chip and can break these real thin uh, layers that we have. It's it, it's just this solder bump that we heat it up. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, leave this area that's kind of open inside our chip. Uh, the rest is going to be covered with this stuff called passivation, which uh, protects the the top metal layers from, from the outside world. So we're going to leave it open. Here too, this is all covered with passivation. And here there'll be a, oops, sorry. Uh, this is going to be uh, everything outside is going to be covered with passivation. This is going to be open so we can actually do the connection. So here, all of this is going to be uh, covered with passivation. This is going to be open for the connection. And then we have to put a bunch of layers inside here, which allow us to make a good connection. And then they're going to stick this uh, solder bump on or a ball, they sometimes call them, uh, which then we can uh, put it onto the substrate, which has a uh, landing area on it and heat it up and this ball will melt and cover this whole area and make both a physical and an electrical connection to it okay um, how do we get to the bumps we have a, an extra layer a top layer which is usually an aluminum type of a um, of a connection called rdl or redistribution layer as you can see in this very small uh, flip chip you have these weird types of routes that go and they're a top layer that route from uh, like the top layer there's a via that goes to this rdl and can connect to these different um uh, uh bumps these uh these bump openings okay but what is it actually underneath that connects to the bonding pads because all we've been talking about right now has been these metal pieces right these interconnect layers so we have something that we call I.O. circuits, input-output circuits. What are the requirements of I.O. circuits? Well, there are lots of them, okay? Um, we have to be able to drive big loads. Remember that now we have in the, in the package, we have these long wires, they're transmission lines. They have these big RLCs. It's not like what a regular uh, little transistor, a little inverter uh, drives. So we have to do something else to be able to drive these big loads that are in, in a different level. Um, second of all, we have to have voltage consistency. Remember that uh, a lot of our um, our off-chip uh, uh, devices have different voltages that are on the board. We're talking about voltages around 1 volt or even lower in our chips today when we have different things that work at 5 volts or 3.3 volts or different types of uh, levels like that, and we have to be able to drive them. We have to have low switching noise. So again, we have um, these transmission lines that have inductance. These are uh, these wires are transmission lines with inductance. We have a lot of uh, um, current 
and we have to make sure that we don't have noise doing that and we have ESD so if uh, you guys have ever walked on a carpet before and then touched something sometimes you get this like shock well that's all this um, charge being um, discharged from your body and that can get to uh, uh, hundreds even thousands of volts which will easily burn out uh, a transistor so we have to make sure that when you something actually touches um, the one of the pins and discharges all that charge into the chip it has to be um, it has to not burn out our, our very little tiny transistors so that's called ESD electrostatic discharge and we'll be discussing that so just as a, a kind of a, a, a bunch of bullet points about that the goals of IO design is to reduce the delay to and from the outside world um, have high drive current capability match the impedance to the load have ESD protection, um, level shift the voltages. In other words, take the, the, the low voltages inside and turn them into big voltages outside or opposite. Meet the specifications of the different interfaces that we have to talk to. And we have to reduce uh, power. We have these big output buffers, which we'll discuss, and we don't want to have any short circuit running through them. And finally, we have to be able to deal with high voltages if we have some sort of an EA, ESD or um, or large voltages that we need to drive like 3.3 volts or 5 volts which uh, our usual transistors aren't able to deal with so these are all goals that we have to deal with in io design which makes it a very complex thing even though logically uh, it's very simple we're just uh, designing a kind of a buffer so here's a short taxonomy of our types of IO cells. So we usually get this IO library similar to a standard cell library, right? But we get an I, a library of IOs. There may be uh, several libraries of IOs that we're going to use. And um, so the standard ones, which we're going to get, um, uh, are what we're going to be discussing now. And they're basically divided into three digital, analog, and power pads. There are all kinds of special cells for special types of um, interfaces, but I'm not going to go into them here. So uh, what do we have? The digital I.O. buffers, the ones over here. What do they do? They provide high drive, uh, up-level shifting output. So they need to drive the outputs. Um, the outputs are these big wires. We need to be able to fill them with, uh, with uh, quickly with their charge. And they need to provide down-level shifting and ESD protection for input. So when we put an input into it, we need to provide, uh, we need to turn the outside voltage into the internal digital voltage. And we have to make sure that we're not going to burn out any circuits due to electrostatic discharge. So those are digital I.O. buffers. Analog I.O. cells, um, what they're going to do is they're going to be some sort of wire that can allow an analog uh, voltage to go to and from the chip, but they also need to provide some sort of ESD protection so we don't burn out the chip. And we have to have power supplies, so these are um, what's going to actually bring the VDD and ground into the, into the chip, and they also provide the basis for the ESD protection. So we're going to discuss all of that now in the coming slides. So let's start with our digital IO buffers. And here on the right, you can see a schematic of what we usually get. Um, I will say that there are IO buffers that are only inputs or only outputs, but often we just get one um, circuit that provides either input or output. Okay, so what we have often is a one of the connections on the circuit is called pad. It may be called something else in your library, but the pad is where we actually take our big piece of metal with all the vias that we discussed before and connect it over to here. So that's what connects to the outside world. If this connects to the outside world, then going this way would be an input circuit and going that way would be an output circuit. So as an input circuit, um, there's no problem that we're actually driving some sort of a, a level to the input. Um, so what comes here will always have this available as an input. Um, on, the, on the other hand, as an output, it is important that if we're driving an input, it doesn't cause some sort of a contention upon this line. So for outputs, we have a special output enable signal that will turn on or off this output uh, driver, depending on if we're using the pad as an input or an output. So when we're using it as an output, we'll, put, we'll turn on this output enable, and then whatever comes here will be driven out to here, and it will also be fed back so we can also look at what we're uh, driving if we if we need to okay so this is the basic circuit uh, we have we have two buffers one going from the internal um, voltage of the, the the digital layer that's the DN will be on like our digital VDD 
right, our internal VDD, and the output voltage will be on some sort of IO VDD, which will usually be higher, so there's an upshift over here. And on the other side, we come here, we have some sort of downshift where we're talking about the IO VDD going into a digital VDD on this side. Okay, and again, what we have to do is we have to select output enable to enable this or else we're going to turn this into a tri state and cut it off if this is being used just as an input. Um, for this, we need to get four voltages. We need to get our VDD, our digital VDD. We need to get because that's what feeds this side and this side of our drivers. Um, we need to have the, the IO VDD, which serves this and this side of the drivers. And we have to have uh, a digital and an IO VSS. Sometimes these are shorted together. Usually these are separate voltages and cannot be shorted together. So remember that this output driver, it needs to drive picofarads. Usually inside chips, we've been talking about femtofarads. That's uh, three orders of magnitude difference, which means that we need these really, really, really big transistors to drive that thing. And yes, this thing is just the buffer. But how do we make this buffer? We use an inverter chain. Uh, these growing inverters and finally the final stage will be huge it will be very very huge and you can see it in our layout below that these are just these things are huge these are very big um, and as you can see the, the the area here in whatever process this uh, picture was taken from they, these are these are mini 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 transistors that are parallel to each other um, uh, doing this uh, type of a, a, a driving okay these it's just this thing is one transistor or or several transistors that are uh, just a small inverter chain. Okay, um, we have parts for ESD protection. We have um, parts for JTAG, which I'm not uh, discussing here. And uh, we have some resistors, which we'll discuss in a second. Okay, you can see that in general, we have this um, type of a, a more complex schematic, which will have other things. For example, um, the pull up and pull down resistors, which uh, will enable us to have things float if they're not, uh, to, to make sure they're not floating in case they're not connected. Okay, um, one thing is that since we have these huge, uh, see these really, really big transistors, we need to make sure there's no short circuit current because if there is a spot where we have, you know, both the NMOS and the PMOS open, we're gonna have this current that's uh, ridiculous that's going through the transistors. So what we'll usually do is we'll give an enable signal that will not be overlapped in order to turn off um, uh, one of the, uh, both of the pull up and pull down before turning on the other one. Okay, so that's another important thing in a digital buffer. When we look at the um, uh, using the buffer as an input, we have to take into account this uh, ESD protection, this electrostatic discharge. So electrostatic discharge is really one of the most important reliability problems in the IC industry. Often when you go to, to test circuits and to work uh, in the lab, you'll be grounded um, because of this. But um, uh, again, we're going to be selling these things all over the place. They're also going to be interacting with all kinds of machines. And we need to make sure that if any charge comes in, it's not going to cause a high voltage that's going to burn out the chip. Okay, so how we do that is we use something called a diode clamp. Okay, so this is our pad and we're looking at the input. So in the end, there's some sort of a trans uh, of an inverter or uh, a bunch of transistors here that are, are going to be in. And if a large voltage comes and hits this gate, it's going to just uh, break down both of these gates. So we can't allow that to happen. So what we do is we stick these diode clamps uh, on uh, on the on the, the, the line here. And what that means is if we get a really high voltage, like a thousand volts or something like that, it's going to turn on this um, resistor, which or this diode, which is usually uh, uh, which is usually in a uh, reverse bias because here we have a VDD and here we have a ground, right? So it's usually a reverse bias diode, but if we all of a sudden get this voltage spike that goes above VDD, 0.7 above VDD, we're going to turn it on and all of the charge, instead of reaching uh, the gate here and burning it out, it's going to be discharged through here. So, uh, s similarly, if we get this minus 1000 volts or actually minus VDD uh, minus 0.7 volts, um, it's going to turn on this guy and uh, it's going to discharge the current through the um, this diode. Okay, so those are those uh, diodes that we have here. And we also will have this resistor that's a current limiting resistor, which will also take part of the voltage on it. It's a very small resistor that's in series. We don't usually like resistors in series with things, but uh, we put it here because it'll, it'll take some of the voltage while the ESD 
is being uh, claimed by these guys. In fact, usually we don't do this in one step. We usually use what we call a primary ESD and a secondary ESD. So the primary ESD will be this really big diodes, but really big diodes take a long time to turn on. So we'll have, after our current limiting resistor, a secondary ESD element, which is a much smaller diode that can turn on fast and provide protection for the, the short amount of time until the primary ESD can, uh, it can take care of all this current. Okay, um, the diodes are made with uh, P diffusions in, in N wells or N diffusions in P substrate, and the resistors are made from either diffusion or polysilicon.